<laughs> Hello there. Hello, Gita. How are you? What a strange way to meet after so many years. I know, but in a wonderful way. Uh, you know, here we are, and we're we're live, and we're talking to each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the new life. Yeah, yeah. So, it, um, unfortunately. Suman Lakhanpa, the head of department, Hello. is here. Hello, Professor Gita. Good uh, evening. Hello, Professor Friedman. Good, good evening and good morning. And okay. <laughs> and thank yeah, you so much. Good morning for, for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good morning for you. <laughs> yeah. Do you I want hope to... it is not a very uncomfortable time for you. No, it's perfect time for me. I'm drinking a cup of coffee. I'm having a nice time. <laughs> I get to talk about plant embryology. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's the most important. Yeah, that's um, nice. Do you want to turn on your, try your presentation? Do you want to sure. Right, yeah. Let me share screen. Yeah. And let's see. And of course, you notice my screen is very messy. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, how, do, how does that look? Um, yeah, it's fine. Do, you want, do this is not ah uh, yes yes yeah looks great. Is can you can you navigate your way? Is that okay? Yeah, sometimes these. I think so. I had to show this picture. Uh, maybe someone's going to show it in the introduction, but I think it's such yeah. a great picture. Yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> picture. Yes, very nice picture. Yeah, okay. and uh, so I think we're all set. <clears throat> okay. Okay, but, uh, so let me get out of there. I'll stop we'll, sharing. We'll just, yeah, we'll just wait for a few minutes because uh, we had given 5.30 uh -huh. as the time. We have five yeah. minutes. Huh? That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I always like logging in a little early just to make sure everything works. That's, that's, that's yeah, always yeah, yeah. better. Yeah. That's always better. Yeah. But I guess there are two kinds of people. My, my, if you had been like my father, who'd always end up at the last minute to catch a plane, He'd probably be <laughs> logging on at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm the other way, especially with with Zoom, because I'm always worried something won't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so that's great. So, how are you doing? I'm fine. Um, you know, we're back to going to work. Um, and uh, at Harvard, everything's, you know, they, they're testing everybody regularly. So um, it, it, it's actually, I'm teaching and I'm in a classroom with students. Oh my. But, they're, you know, as you, yeah, it's very nice. And I don't know that you've been to the Arnold Arboretum, but the Arboretum that I also, you know, it's been filled with people during the pandemic. So oh. we've had millions of visitors. So oh. it's also, you know, a very exciting time to think about public spaces and, uh, green and uh, <laughs> parks and so forth. Right, right, right. And this is a this tells you what time of year it is here. Uh, those are maple Samara oh, wings. Oh, oh. Ah, yeah. So you have your backdrop according to the scene season. I I use I take lots and lots of pictures all the time, so I change it all the time. I just happen to take. I was in the maple collection the other day, and uh, yeah. but. Uh, so, uh, have all students come back, or is it an optional kind of a thing for them? No, it's not optional. All the students are back. They have to be uh, vaccinated. And then for, if you're an undergraduate at Harvard, you are tested three times a week. I'm tested once a week, <clears throat> but we all have to be vaccinated. The rate, the, the actual rate of vaccination at Harvard is around 96%. So there are some people who haven't been uh, vaccinated. You, you know, in the US we have some who just refuse. Um, well, quite a lot, but not up in where I am. And so everyone's back, everyone's coming to work. Uh, how about how about you? Uh, I am retired. <laughs> so many should answer that question. I think they've got the university open two days ago, I think. She's opening in a phased manner, not completely. We are taking, uh, you know, practicals in an offline manner. Just last week we started, uh, but mm -hmm. not all the students are able to join in. There are still many yeah. students who are 
not in Delhi and they are finding it difficult to find accommodation and things like mm. that. So there are issues, but still some beginning has been made. <laughs> yeah. I know it's going to be a long process. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like an outlier. Maybe I should just turn my back button off. You can see my wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. Here we go. No background. Now you can see where I am. Yeah, you really are. Okay. <laughs> That's, there I am. There's Charles Darwin. There he, whoops, right there is when he was a young man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I happen to like old clocks. Hmm? Yeah. No, I've been enjoying your recent stuff on evolutionary history, I guess, of a different mm. kind. Yeah. Yeah, the history of evolution. Yeah, I'm, Okay. history of evolution and I'm, I'm working on a new really early 1811 botanist who wrote about evolution so <clears throat> no one's ever written about him and it's been sitting there no one's read it Who's um, that? so um his he's a frenchman uh his name is jean louis marie poire <clears throat> i'm sure that's not very well done for, the, for french but uh well, but, your french is he, better than <laughs> but he knew he was a close associate of lamarck and began to develop ideas about evolution of plants uh and then he started writing about them and and he's a fascinating individual so i've just been in the last few months to get serious about him and uh so he's my, but I'm very, very interested in botanical and horticultural questions because the zoologists write all the history and they always forget about the botanists. So I'm, I'm, I want to make things fair. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we need more people like you. <laughs> um, so just thought you might like to know, Ned, that um, Maybe you know, a lot, there were a large number of registrants, like over 700. I don't know how many will actually attend, but it is huge. Good evening, Honorable Speaker, Professor William Friedman, distinguished guests, members of Professor H.Y. Mohan Ram's family, my dear colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Department of Botany, University of Delhi, it is my privilege and honor to extend a warm welcome to each one of you at the inception of virtual series of HYM Memorial Lectures. In the same month in which we all celebrated Teacher's Day on September 5th to mark birthday of our former president, scholar, philosopher, Bharat Ratan, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, we all have convened today to commemorate birth anniversary of a teacher par excellence, Professor H.Y. Mohan Ram, lovingly called as H.Y.M. by one and all. Felicitously reckoned as Doyen of Indian Botany, Professor Mohan Ram was extremely passionate about promoting and popularizing science. He had the skill of making even the most complex information accessible to audiences of all ages and stages of learning. His excellent research and mentor skills throughout his long and productive academic career have formed a template for many generations of students and teachers. HYM was a genuine polymath a Renaissance man with, vivid, with bewildering diversities of interest and pursuits that could never be cribbed and confined within the boundaries, be it music, cricket, traveling, and photography. So here we are, remembering and honoring HYM with a talk series in his name, supported by his family, Dr. Susmita Ram, his daughter, a well-known educationist, and his son, Rahul Ram, the lead vocalist of internationally acclaimed music band, Indian Ocean. Today, we also pay our rich tribute to Dr. Mansi Ram, his beloved wife, who taught in Miranda House, University of Delhi, a great teacher of botany, who is remembered as an accomplished botanist 
an exemplary soulmate famous and is being terribly missed for her motherly presence by all the students of botany department i would like to apprise to all present here that the virtual uh, platform for this lecture series is not out of compulsion but out of choice considering the widespread popularity of professor mohan ram across various geographical realms thankfully this technology is befitting to cater to much broader spectrum of audience across the globe today's lecture which is first in the series will be delivered by an equally accomplished speaker professor william fridman director of honored arboretum arboretum harvard university on the topic darwin's abominable mystery and search for the first flowering plant on that note i once again take the privilege of extending the most cordial welcome to professor william fridman and each one of you in attendance today whatever little that we are going to recall about late professor mohan ram to commemorate his immortal presence on the occasion of his birth anniversary is going to be an overture to the magnificent persona that he was without exhausting much of your time i solemnly request professor suman lakhanpal senior professor and head of the department to kindly introduce the brilliant personality of professor h y mohan ram to the audience ladies and gentlemen before we proceed further i humbly request all the participants of the session to mute their audio and switch off their cameras so as to pre prevent fleeting errors in between the sessions may i request professor suman lakhanpal to please introduce the audience about professor mohan ram thank you ma'am thank you professor rupam thanks a lot honorable professor friedman distinguished scientists of botany fraternity senior colleagues participants and dear students and most respectable members of professor mohan ram's family it is a matter of proud privilege for me to be a part of this program being organized by department of botany university of delhi that is initiation of a lecture series that aims to celebrate a great life the life of professor hole narasipur yoga narsimhan mohan ram popularly known as professor h y mohan ram and to many only h y m one of the most esteemed guru to all of us we embark upon this celebration inspired by his journey of richly experienced life which he led with passion for nature compassion for fellow colleagues and a deep desire to inculcate the pursuit of botany among generations of students he was a true botanist an endangered class of scientists these days with vast knowledge in all areas of plant sciences more than six decades of academic pursuits of professor mohan ram including his association with department of botany several areas of academics education at all levels plant research in all possible ways policies administration organization abilities are very well known and have been recorded by various people so i have a daunting task ahead of me to give a very brief account of professor mohan ram's life and work for the sake of students and others who were not fortunate enough to know him professor mohan ram was born this very day 91 years ago that is 24th september 1930 at mysore karnataka to illustrious parents his father was a great sanskrit scholar
and an accomplished musician. His mother, a courageous and liberated daughter of extraordinary talent, each one of them excelled in their chosen fields. That included Professor H. Y. Sharda Prasad, press advisor to four prime ministers of India, and Sri Narayan Dadji, who was a renowned Hindi scholar and headed the Hindi feature section of Press Trust of India for decades, to name a few. Professor Ram obtained his BSc from University of Mysore, MSc from Agra University, PhD from Department of Botany, University of Delhi, under the supervision of the world-renowned embryologist, Professor Panjanan Maheshwari, a fellow of Royal Society. He continued his long career in the same department as lecturer, leader, professor, head of the department and director, Center of Advanced Studies in Botany. He continued scientific activities well beyond his superannuation as INSA senior scientist, INSA honorary scientist, Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Visiting Fellow, and Srinivas Raman, Ramanujam Professor and remained academically active practically all his life. An attempt to summarize his scientific contributions is an unsurmountable task that needs a separate talk or perhaps a full seminar. Briefly, and most notably, post PhD, he worked at Cornell University, Ithaka, as a Fulbright and Smith Mundt Fellow with the legendary scientist F.C. Stewart of Totipotency fame. His several pioneering works during his stay at Cornell and upon his return to India included banana tissue culture, endosperm culture, development of true seeds in potato, induction of pollen sterility by application of growth regulators, prolonging vast life of cut flowers, use of in vitro techniques to understand insectivorous behavior in plants, use of growth substances in reversing the sex of male and female flowers, and so on. He made some minor contributions in understanding the life strategies of aquatic plants. He was particularly fascinated by the members of family Podostomaceae that have thalloid plants lacking defined roots and shoots and are able to remain attached to rocks even in the fast flowing waters using hold fast and adhesive hairs. Another group of plants that fascinated him was bamboos, their biology and mass multiplication. He also worked on reproductive biology of selected plants that are getting endangered due to over-exploitation, such as Boswellia, Comifora, and Stracculia. The research work and topics that fascinated him are available in 250 research papers, books, articles, and lecture presentations. Choice of his research topics on his lectures and their contents revealed important aspects of his personality, unique, thoughtful, unassuming, but deeply intriguing, fascinated by nature and in particular by plants, mixed with his great sense of humor. He played a significant role in establishing several departments such as Department of Genetics, Department of Environmental Sciences in University of Delhi, and even institutes such as CSR Institute for Himalayan Bioresource Technology and many others. He was a recipient of nearly all major awards bestowed upon academicians in India and was a member of all science academies. Most interestingly, other than academics, his love and passion for music, excursions to botanically rich places in India and abroad, photography, revision of educational school syllabi, etc. are well known. He was, to quote his contemporary, a great communicator, educator, integrator, facilitator, and much more. Deeply loved and respected, soft-spoken Professor H. Y. Mohan Ram left for his heavenly abode on June 18, 2018. Rich tributes had poured in verbal condolences, written messages, obituaries in scientific journals and national dailies, and prayer meetings. Everyone, everyone agreed that the void left by him can never be filled. And the fact is that we miss him every day. But this is also true that not a day passes when something or other does not bring his memories and along with an instant smile on our faces. His fascinating anecdotes, 
how the scientific name of neem tree as a director came from the arabic word azad darakht how the plant with the lightest wood as chinomini got coined by a britisher from the reply of a villager in a vernacular language ishka naam nahi or how goats in deserts and showed bleeding of poisonous latex in calotropis leaves by nibbling the leaf tips before grazing them etymology of the word tip tip used in coffee houses and restaurants to ensure promptness from the services by waiters or one of his favorite quote scientists do not take nonsense from anyone except from themselves i can go on and on it's a long list that remains etched in the brains of hundreds of his students that was hym one of the most loved and respected teacher of botany department and a great botanist personally for me and several others like me he has left indelible messages about being a mentor and not just a teacher a passionate seeker of knowledge rather than just a scientist a lifelong guru and not a mere phd supervisor a caring friend and not just a formal colleague and most importantly the message that life is beautiful and we must not bury ourselves only in academics but enjoy all aspects of life music literature nature's beauty sports and even bollywood movies for that matter ladies and gentlemen a celebration of such a great botanist necessitated that we have an equally distinguished plant scientist as the inaugural speaker of this lecture series initiated in his memory we are indeed delighted to have professor william friedman director arnold arboretum arnold professor of organism and evolutionary biology harvard university an eminent botanist who i believe knew professor ram well and his work to deliver the inaugural lecture today we also have professor r geeta with us who has been a student and an extraordinary teacher of botany department who retired a couple of years ago and is now settled in chennai and is sorely missed by one and all in this department her painfully short stint in the department was highly invigorating and was responsible for resurrecting the interest of the students and faculty members in evolutionary biology the soul of all biological sciences Professor Geeta had a long association with Professor Mohan Ram and has imbibed many of his qualities as a teacher and as a researcher and reflects Professor Mohan Ram in so many ways we are thankful to her for gracing this occasion as a moderator with this i request professor geeta to introduce the distinguished speaker of the day professor william friedman and take forward the program stage is all yours geeta thank you suman uh, that was an excessive uh, introduction to me but it was marvelous one for monram professor monram and uh, ned uh, i'll try to um, coordinate this whole meeting at the best of my ability uh, it is a really great pleasure to welcome and introduce professor william friedman or ned friedman as he is known to many i don't know the history of that but uh, that's who he is uh, professor okay? friedman as had been said is, sorry you want to say this something said somebody said something okay um he is at the harvard, at harvard I, university I, 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 uh can you uh, uh audience please turn oh, off so your i don't know who has their mic on but please turn it off thank you um so professor friedman is at harvard so, university what's happening aur ye jo hai ji isko agar aap dal dijiyega abhi ke liye wahan piche yahan pe zarurat nahi iski hai na wahan pe piche dal dijiye bas chaan ji uska ball um sorry we are trying to mute this person we are trying to mute this person i don't know who is he okay 
um sorry about that um, so professor friedman is at harvard university where he's a director he's the eighth director of the arnold arboretum the arnold arboretum for those who don't know is a wonderful collection of arboretum of trees and of all kinds and uh, he is a right curator and custodian of those at this point he's also arnold professor at the department of organismic and evolutionary biology he's been there since 2011 i believe 10. Uh, he came there after many years as faculty at the universities of colorado before that university of georgia he got his doctoral degree from uc berkeley in botany, no less. So that's marvelous. Uh, he followed that up with a postdoctoral stint with uh, Michael Donahue at the University of Arizona, which is where we overlapped by a few months when I was a fresh graduate student and he was a glorious uh, you know, PhD already. Um, Ned's contributions to the biological sciences have been widely recognized. I am not listing everything uh, for uh, time, say, so, sake of time, but prominently manifest is it's his being elected as fellow of the Linnaean Society as early as 1995 and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2011. He was awarded the Pelton Award, I like this one, by the Botanical Society of America for sustained and imaginative contributions in the field of plant developmental biology and very apt, I think. Ned has been remarkable in the way he has over the past over 30 years. He's been chipping away at the you know, development of traits of early angiosperms and their closest relatives several lineage, lineages of gymnosperms, but in particular the neophytes, all in order to understand the origin and early evolution of angiosperms. He has focused on the development and evolution of embryological traits, which is very close to the interests of many of the department of today and of the you know, uh, bygone eras. Um, and therefore, you know, definitely made him the obvious choice for this talk. His emphasis, and this is another wonderful thing, has been on the morphological aspects of development, informed by the underlying molecular processes where possible. But, you know, the, the, the idea of integrating it and definitely first relying on the morphological um, traits to understand what's going on has led to remarkable insights into the evolution of the female gametophyte, of double fertilization in seed plants, and of the endosperm in angiosperms. The last obviously has taken him into other line of work in which he uh, to, you know, deals with the idea of endosperm as the second embryo whose evolution involved the bloody battles between related to kin selection, between uh, related uh, beings. And more recently and interestingly to me, he's been looking at another major transition of evolution, that of the advent of land plants and their, fung and their fungal partners. Now, this is by no means any kind of an uh, appropriate or complete description of his work, but I thought this last bit is what is more, you know, I, I really wanted to sort of point this out. In a recent article in the Harvard Magazine, Ned, I should say, confesses, I am an or organismic biologist, a plant morphologist to be more precise. I would go further and say that he's actually a card carrying botanist in the fullest sense of the word. As we see that from his research, which is directed towards, you know, the vertical integration, as I said, from the molecular to the morphological level, illuminated by evolution and focused on developmental embryology. The intent is to understand plants in the fullest sense. And from his virtual presence, posts on the Arnold Arboretum uh, website, the director's posts on Instagram, as well on Facebook, those who have not, please, I encourage you to go look at them. Um, wonderful descriptions of the plants, the natural history, photographs, um, the ultimate purveyor of plant love. So what's not to like? I think HYM would approve, and I am very, very happy to have you here. Before handing over the floor to Ned, I would like to request the audience again, uh, please do turn off your videos and, and mute your microphone during the talk. Please post your uh, questions in the chat box, which is at the bottom of the WhatsApp window, so that these may be posed to uh, Ned. He will also be able to see them. 
Uh, I now have the honor of inviting Professor Friedman to deliver the first of the HYM Memorial Talks. Next. Wow. Well, I thank you so much for an incredibly kind uh, and overly gracious introduction, uh, per, I, Perfecta. Uh, we've known each other for so long. It's just so nice, even if it's virtual, uh, back in, in contact and, and in conversation. Um, I also uh, want to thank uh, the, the department head, uh, Professor Lacampol, uh, for her kind uh, invitation to present this lecture today. Um, it's a great honor. Before I begin my presentation, I think it's important that I everyone know that I am a boss. That nothing could be a, a, a higher praise of anybody, in my opinion. But because of my long love of embryology, plant embryology, obviously, morphology and plant, uh, the department Part of botany at the University of Delhi uh, occupies a very special in my heart. I have read hundreds and hundreds of papers from the students and the faculty uh, and all of the scholars in the botany department of the University of Delhi throughout my career. I can remember reading embryology of Maheshwari and, and of many others just as a 21-year-old uh, first graduate student. So even though I cannot be there in person, I want all of you to know that I don't think there could be a higher honor for me to be by the Department of Botany at the University of Delhi to, to deliver this lecture uh, to inaugurate in honor of Professor Mohan Ram. Uh, it is, uh, his life is, is, and I've read the memoirs, the memorials, uh, and uh, his life exemplifies what it means to be a botanist, to be passionately in love with plants a mentor to make you share the mad plants with around you. And I think that's a special attribute uh, history of botany departments. I just want to say uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is special for me and uh, I did to be with you uh, in your, your time zone in mine. I'm going to share my screen now and let's hope everything goes well. You'll discover I have a very messy screen, uh, which is not uh, hopefully a surprise, uh, but <clears throat> if everything is working, you now can see the title of the uh, seminar and a portrait of Charles Darwin in his older age. That is the portrait that you can see behind me. Uh, a wonderful picture, uh, a portrait of, of Charles Darwin, who referred to the origin of flowering plants as an abominable mystery. Now, uh, I just want to say that uh, I loved seeing the collage of images uh, of, of Professor Mohan Ram and was delighted to see that he had visited the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, and I would love to have copies of some of those images uh, for our archives. It would be very nice to have them. I know the spots and, and I'm, I'm just so pleased to see them. But the picture tells so person of, 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 of devotion, of intensity, of friendliness. And I, I just love uh, this image of, of Professor Mohan Ram and his wife, Monsi. Um, I also uh, just wanted, of, of the many things I read, uh, just sometimes a single sentence can capture so much. And I love this uh, 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 description and, and memorial or, uh, in phytomorphology in 2018. He was an educator of all who chose to be educable, an administrator, a conservationist, an historian of science, a student of politics, a student of human nature, and as already mentioned, a facilitator, a person who makes things easier and better. He was a mentor, family man, and a friend to all who would accept his generous friendship. If only all of us could be so fortunate to have that written uh, after we've been here on earth. Uh, it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous thing. So now I'm going to start with a very simple question, one that I have been thinking about for so long, uh, I can hardly remember the beginnings of it now that I, uh, but it certainly goes back to the 1980s. And it's a simple question. The question is, what is endo? And you might think, well, such a simple question might have a pretty straightforward answer. Well, let's start by saying, uh, first of all, what endosperm is in the literal sense. 
Um, here I have a section of um, a, 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 an angiosperm or a, a seed, and there's a small embryo right here. And then there's all of this tissue inside of the seed, which is the endosperm. And as I think all of you know, uh, the mother plant that is going to uh, mature this seed is going to turn over food and put it into this endosperm. And this endosperm will continue to grow at the same time that the small embryo here is growing until the embryo uh, actually ends up consuming, eating all of the endosperm and uh, developing to the fullest extent that it can within a seed. And here you can see the two cotyledons, the root pole and so forth. So we think of endosperm as a tissue within a seed that uh, is designed and has evolved to acquire food from the maternal mother plant and then turn it over and get a young embryo, uh, enough food to start its life and then germinate and go out into the world. But it's worth noting that none of us would be here if it was not for the evolution of endosperm. 70% of the calories consumed by human beings on earth our endosperm. And I suspect uh, in Delhi and in general in India it is probably closer to 80%. Uh, this is popped endosperm. Uh, we evolved essentially in terms of human evolution and culture by actually learning how to domesticate the most important part of a plant for our purposes, which is endosperm. Here is endosperm that can be served uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, endosperm is the center of uh, early uh, domestication of crops uh, and uh, throughout the world and, of, of course, of our own being here. Without the evolution of endosperm, simply uh, put, there would not be human beings and the human cultures that we, we ourselves are part of. So endosperm is actually a very, very important tissue, even though I only study the basic aspects of it uh, and its evolution, it is central to our, our own existence. So where does it come from? Well, this is a developmental question, and this question actually was not uh, uh, something that could have been answered until the very end of the 19th century. And in the late 1890s, a French embryologist, his name was Louis Guignard, uh, was doing microscopy and looking at the fertilization process. And here we have an embryo sac or female gametophyte. This is the egg cell right here. And what he found was that he could trace a sperm from a pollen tube that would end up uh, matching up with an egg nucleus to create a zygote. That much was already known. But what wasn't known in, until uh, 1898 and 1899 was that in the middle of the female gametophyte, where there are these two haploid nuclei called polar nuclei, the second sperm of the pollen tube would go into this cell and as you can see magnified down here, it would fuse with the two haploid female nuclei to create a fertilization product that was the beginning nucleus and cell of endosperm. And uh, this is the process of double fertilization that we now know is present in essentially all flowering plants. It doesn't matter whether you're a magnolia uh, or you're uh, something in the genus Cornus or in the Moraceae, everything has endosperm. And if you were to look at a, a conceptual section through a seed of a flowering plant, you will always find an embryo that's derived from the first fertilization event that's diploid. And you typically find a triploid endosperm surrounding it. And the mother turns over the food to the endosperm and the endosperm turns the food over to the embryo. So angiosperms have a triploid, typically biparental genetically, meaning a mother's genome, uh, 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 genetics and a father's genetics are in it, embryo nourishing tissue. <clears throat> now I'm gonna ask where did it come from, uh, which is not a developmental question, but an evolutionary question. And this is where things get difficult. Here are the living groups of seed plants, the flowering plants, the cycads and the ginkgos, uh, the nitales, uh, ephedra, which uh, has a species native to India. Uh, the conifers are now thought to be uh, enmeshed in the evolutionary history of the nitales. Uh, and we have this bare bones. These are only the living groups. Of course, there are another 20 groups of seed plants that have been on the planet and have all gone extinct, sadly. Uh, so we can only study certain aspects of them. And what we know uh, in these groups, uh, when we talk about Wellwichia, or we talk about Pinus, or we talk about Ginkgo or Cycad, 
is that when they nourish their young embryos, they do it with a structure that is a female gametophyte that is haploid and only has maternal genetics in it. This is true essentially of almost all gymnosperms or non-flowering uh, seed plants. They have a single fertilization event to create an embryo. The uh, second sperm from a pollen tube essentially is not used uh, and they have this, this female gametophyte. So if you were to go and look at a ginkgo uh, seed, like I have here, and you were to cut it open, you would find a very large haploid female gametophyte, which has taken the food from the mother plant and is actually going to eventually turn it over to the embryo uh, when it germinates out of the seed. So we have two conditions in seed plants. We have all of the non-flowering plants have a single fertilization. They produce an embryo and the mother turns her food over to, the diploid mother turns her food over to the haploid female gametophyte, which nourishes the embryo. And then we have in most flowering plants, a double fertilization process in which you have a triploid biparental embryo nourishing tissue. The mother turns her food over to the, uh, the endosperm, which then turns it over to the embryo. And the question is, how did we get from here to here? It seems like a very simple question, one that we ought to be able to answer. But I can tell you for over a century, people have been thinking very hard about this question. And just after the discovery of double fertilization at the end of the 19th century, people around the world were asking, how, does, how do we interpret the evolutionary origin of endosperm and double fertilization? And here is a wonderful uh, passage from a, a very prominent early uh, embryologist, a woman in England, her name was Ethel Sargent, and she said, Finally, in 1908, after all of this intense thought, we have so far no links, living or fossil, which enable us to trace the historical development of the endosperm and angiosperms with any degree of certainty. And this is a really interesting uh, statement. It says, with all of the thinking about, we know where we began, we know where we ended up, we seem unable to connect these things in terms of evolution and evolutionary history. So I hope to illuminate that question today. And I'm going to ask a very simple question. First of all, how did double fertilization evolve? Well, when I was young, and uh, uh, Gita will remember, uh, there were many hypotheses in the early days of cladistics when people were doing morphological cladistic analyses before molecular uh, information was brought to bear on phylogenetic relationships. And there was a hypothesis at that, that time that the Neteles were the closest living relatives of flowering plants. Now, I didn't do this work. I'm a morphologist and an embryologist, but the plant uh, systematists were doing this work, and this was the best hypothesis. As I can tell you right now, it is no longer the best hypothesis, um, and it died in 1999 when a lot of molecular uh, work was brought to bear on the relationships of seed plants. But nevertheless, in the 1980s, this was what we, we had to work with, and I immediately began to work on the genus Ephedra, uh, which is a desert uh, shrub, um, but one that had been investigated. Actually, uh, embryologists in India had looked at this, embryologists in France, embryologists around the world at various times had done some work with this group. But what I found uh, was that every time I looked under the microscope at the egg cell of the genus Ephedra, I found that there were two sperm inside of the egg, one here, one here. And this is, by the way, a section where we've used a fluorochrome, a, a fluorescent dye that binds to DNA. So you're seeing the DNA. And here's the egg nucleus in the egg cell. This is going to create a zygote. But what I found each time I looked at the zygote was that I found that there was another nucleus in the, that was a female nucleus. This is the ventral canal nucleus, uh, which is the mitotic sister nucleus of the egg nucleus. This nucleus fused with the second sperm. And this was a very exciting. This is 1990 when I first published this in Science. Uh, uh, and and uh, I was very excited to discover this because maybe this meant that the double fertilization occurred outside of flowering plants. And this picture you're looking at here, these pictures took one full year of of work you know, of a technician with me in the lab to get an electron microscopy image of the second sperm fusing with the ventral canal nucleus 
and this uh, the sper first sperm fusing with the egg nucleus. You can even see the uh, nuclear bridges between the envelopes. Um, this was just sheer force of will. We worked and we worked and we worked, and eventually we could really document this process. But then the question was, well, what happens to that second fertilization event? And that took another two years of sectioning in the microtome uh, and looking under the microscope endlessly to find the very moment when we could find this out. And what we eventually found out, or what I found out, was that the first fertilization event, as was expected, turned into a zygote, but the second fertilization event produced an ex extra zygote. There were twin zygotes that were produced, and that's, this we published in Science then. Well, I was then curious about other members of the Neetales, like Needham, uh, which is typically a tropical liana, and we discovered with a graduate student of mine, uh, Jeffrey Carmichael, that double fertilization was a regular part of the uh, reproductive biology of Needham that produced twin zygotes. Uh, you can see them here in, in uh, glowing because of their DNA after the, the sperm are fused with the female gametes. And then more recently, I finally returned to uh, Wellwitchia um, because I was curious whether Wellwitchia, which is one of the strangest plants embryologically, it's the most bizarre embryology I think of any plant in the world, but a delightful thing. And I could track the two sperm as they got closer to the two potential female uh, gametes. But what was interesting is I discovered recently that only one of the sperm ends up fusing with a female egg cell to produce a zygote, and the second sperm does nothing and the second egg does nothing. Um, so we actually only have a single fertilization event in Wellwitchia. And so what I can tell you with the new phylogenetic relationships with the Neetales embedded in conifers and not closely related to flowering plants, is that we actually have two different kinds of double fertilization events that are not evolutionary related to them. Now, when I first discovered this and the Neetales were hypothesized to be closely related to the flowering plants, the best working hypothesis was that double fertilization arose in their common ancestor, but that's no longer a tenable hypothesis. Rather, it looks like there is a double fertilization process in the common ancestor of the Neetales that was lost in Wellwitchia and a separately evolved double fertilization process in the common ancestor of flowering plants. I will note that there are hints of occasional double fertilization processes in pines and in other conifers. None of these have been studied. So for embryological students at the university in the botany department at Delhi, there's incredibly interesting old literature. I've reviewed it, but I can tell you I have not studied it. It could be a fantastic dissertation product. So what could this possibly mean? Well, first of all, I would argue that for almost 2 billion years, male gametes have been meeting female gametes, and they are genetically and developmentally programmed to pair. And for all of the time uh, that you have these kinds of pairings, you end up with zygotes and embryos. But in seed plants, which have been around over 300 million years, it has always been the case that every pollen tube produces two sperm. And it's been curious, why two sperm when you only need one? I do not know the answer. But every pollen tube delivers two sperm to the target of fertilization. And typically, female gamete producing entities, the female gametophytes, often produce a second fecundable or fertilizable nucleus or cell. So since the beginning of, flower, of seed plant evolution, there has always been the potential for double fertilization events. This is true in the Neetales, it's true in ginkgo, in cycads, and in conifers. This pollen tubes have been bringing two sperm to a, an egg cell that almost always has an extra female nucleus that can potentially be fertilized. So we shouldn't be surprised if occasionally, and uh, in the case of Neetales, often the second sperm meets a second female gamete and produces an extra embryo. So even though double fertilization in the Neetales is not evolutionarily related to double fertilization in angiosperms, I would like to suggest that we really are getting an insight into how double fertilization in all lineages of seed plants could have begun. It would have begun by essentially putting the second sperm uh, into proximity to a second female gamete, and that would produce an extra embryo. So this is a hypothetical intermediate. Uh, we still have the embryos being nourished by the haploid female gametophyte. 
And as all of us should know for embryologists, seeds of, of seed plants do not typically produce two embryos that come out of the seed. Ultimately, only one embryo fills the seed, and it would probably be the first embryo. Although we don't know in the axion ephedra which of the embryos is actually typically successful. So this is a hypothetical. This still leaves us a good distance from the triploid condition of most flowering plants with a genetically biparental endosperm. So let's continue uh, asking something. And this is the first question I want to ask. Can an extra embryo in, an, in a gymnosperm seed be sacrificed to a developmental program of altruism, determinate growth, and program death? Because if the extra embryo in double fertilization is going to evolve into an endosperm, it has to stop becoming an embryo and it has to start becoming something that helps another embryo. Hence altruism, it has to stop being able to grow into a plant and it has to be allow itself to be consumed by the other embryo and it has to be programmed to die. Well, back in the 1990s, I began to think about this. And although I'm not a theoretician, I quickly realized that the only way to answer the question, can an embryo give its life to another embryo in a, in a gymnosperm was to do some basic uh, mathematical work. And this was published a long time ago in, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what I looked at was what would happen if you had double fertilization events within uh, an egg cell or archegonium of a gymnosperm, and you always have more than one archegonium in gymnosperms, and you had an altruist embryo, could you evolve an embryo that gave up its own life? And if they cooperate, if, if twin embryos begin to cooperate and one of them dies, the question was, would this potentially be selected for during evolution? And what I, without going into the equations, what I want you to understand is that the eggs in all of these embryos are genetically identical, but the father of these pair and the father of this pair are not related. They're two different pollen grains. So fathers are actually fighting to win to fill a, a seed. So if you can cooperate with one father within an egg and beat another father, in theory, you can evolve altruism. And I said at the time, endosperm in the physiological and behavioral sense had to be because the equation said so, initially diploid, and the present triploid nature of endosperm, which is something we thought at the time defined the, all of the angiosperms from their very beginning, represents a later modification of the second fertilization event that is entirely unrelated to the initial acquisition of embryo nourishing behavior. In other words, in 1995, I predicted that the first kinds of endosperm would be diploid even though at the time everyone believed that the first endosperms were triploid because in angiosperms, that was what people thought among living groups. Now, let's just take my hypothesis a little bit further and say that we have double fertilization in a typical gymnosperm where you have an extra embryo and that extra embryo becomes more and more helpful to its sibling and eventually it becomes a diploid endosperm. And this is what I hypothesized the first angiosperms would be like, even if we didn't, even if they were extinct. And then eventually that diploid endosperm would turn into a triploid endosperm. So this was my hypothesis. And this endosperm here would be the, the evolutionary derivative of an altruist embryo. In other words, endosperm evolved from an embryo that became an altruist. Now, what was next? I began to ask, could it be possible that the first flowering plants actually had diploid endosperms? Now, the dogma when I was uh, an, you know, young uh, was that all of the uh, angiosperms, almost all of them had triploid endosperms. We knew of exceptions that had higher ploides, pentaploid, nonaploid, all kinds of things. But you would have read a standard textbook and it would have said something like this, double fertilization and the development of a copious triploid endosperm from a triple fusion nucleus. The two haploid nuclei I showed you in that very old uh, diagram uh, with the sperm are clearly primitive characters within the angiosperm. That's dogma. But I was a little bit concerned about dogma. And dogma was based on old phylogenetic understandings, things like magnolias were the earliest lineages of flowering plants. 
But in 1999, not only did the Neteles uh, begin to move away and migrate away from angiosperms, but the phylogenetic relationships of angiosperms based on the DNA began to be reshuffled. And here you can see, which is our current ideas, that the most ancient lineages of flowering plants are a single species, Amborella, that lives in New Caledonia, the water lilies, and the Austrobaleales. The magnolia-like plants are up here. The monocots and the eudicots are here. We have some other groups. But I knew immediately that these were groups that were understudied, that people had done embryology. And again, I went back to the papers from the 1900s, the early 1900s, the mid 1900s, and I began to appreciate that something did not add up, that there was something wrong, that people were saying that uh, these plants had triploid endosperms, but I was not convinced. And here's Amborella, one of its, it's, it's dioecious, it's female flower, uh, very simple. Here's a water lily. Uh, and here is Austrobalia, which is one of my favorite. Uh, it's a liana. Uh, this is a growing in our greenhouses here at Harvard uh, in flower, very beautiful plant. But you can see that people began to write about these. And one, this is a review paper uh, from 2000, right after the new phylogenies came out. And they said that Amborella and the water lilies and the Austrobaleales had a certain type of female gametophyte. And those of you who are embryologists will know this is a polygonum female gametophyte. And what this means is that polygonum female gametophytes always form triploid endosperm, meaning they have two female haploid nuclei that meet a sperm. And if you are an embryologist, I'll just note that they always were described as having antipodal cells, the three cells at the other end of the female gametophyte that went away very quickly. They were ephemeral. You never saw them. Well, uh, this means that the first flowering plants with the new phylogenies had triploid biparental endosperms. But I wanted to look. Um, these were, that was a review of the literature, and it was an extensive and excellent review. But I, I just went back to the original literature. And this is something I, I hope to uh, impress upon students, graduate students. We live in a world where so much of our literature is reviews of reviews of reviews. And there is no substitute for reading original primary literature. Over time, reviews of reviews of reviews uh, lose track of the original observations. And so I'll, I will tell you, I read 19th century literature all of the time. I read 20th century literature all of the time. The last five years are not all of scientific literature. So please go back and always read primary sources. And I was not convinced that triploid endosperm characterized water lilies because I looked at the original descriptions. So we began to study water lilies. Here's NUFAR. And this is, again, with a DNA uh, fluorescent dye. And you can see here, these are the two helper cells uh, that uh, are surround the egg cell. And you can see this. Uh, so these are the synergids. Um, but, uh, and here is the central cell, the target of the second fertilization event. And we only could find four nuclei in four cells, not seven cells and eight nuclei as in polygonum type. Well, this was a problem. This was not what people predicted, because if this was the case, uh, you would not get triploid endosperm. But let me tell you something. In Arabidopsis, for example, you form a polygonum type female gametophyte with an egg cell, two helper cells, the antipodals that actually go on to die, and the target of the second fertilization event is two haploid female nuclei. They typically fuse before the sperm arrive, and these cells die, and what are you looking at? Four cells and four nuclei, just like I showed you in a water lily. But the target of the second fertilization event was two haploid nuclei that had fused, and this would produce a triploid endosperm. This would be very different than if the original thing that we were looking at had only undergone a certain number of divisions to, to create a haploid nucleus for the second fertilization, event, and there had never been any antipodals. But they look identical. Under the microscope, you cannot tell them apart. So we had to figure out whether we were looking at something where there had been a fusion event and cell death, or we were looking at something like this, because this would produce triploid endosperm and this would produce diploid endosperm. And we did this with some wonderful equipment that actually could measure how much light was coming out of this nucleus and how much light was coming out of this nucleus. And the light levels would tell us how much DNA and these are just relative fluorescence units, but the point is the amount of light coming out of an egg nucleus was 10 units. 
And the amount coming out of the target of the second fertilization, this female gamete nucleus, was also 10 units, meaning the egg and the central cell are both haploid because the egg has to be haploid. In other words, this was not the product of the fusion of two nuclei in the central cell, and this was a haploid target. We went on to look at all kinds of other water lilies in the Hydatelaceae, which people thought until very recently were grasses, uh, but are in fact real water lilies. Uh, and we uh, looked at members of the Ostrobaleales. I looked everywhere uh, that we could. Uh, we looked at Trimenia and went to Australia to collect the material. Uh, and we looked at all kinds of things. The end result is we never found any cells at the other end of the female gametophyte, the antipodals. They were never there. We always fell in an egg with two synergids and one haploid target of double for the second fertilization event. And oh, let me go back. I'm sorry. So what this tells me is when everyone described ephemeral cells at the bottom here, they were saying they were ephemeral because they never saw them. But they were so imbued with the dogma of the day that they assumed this was a polygonum type female gametophyte with two nuclei in the middle that were in the central cell and three cells that had degenerated before they got a section of it. The other hypothesis is they weren't there. So this also tells you of how observations can be shaped by expectations. So the key oftentimes is to shed all the expectation and simply ask, what does the plant tell me? Go to the plant. My mentor, Professor Kaplan, always said, let the plant tell you the answer. Uh, not what other people think. Well, I went on to study Amborella, and of course it was very badly behaved, but quite fun. And we found an entirely new type of female gametophyte with an extra synergid, but it actually puts two female nuclei into play. And this was published in Nature. Uh, and it actually does produce uh, antipodals and sometimes, uh, you know, extra, uh, just a mess, but a fascinating one. And what I can tell you is that the best uh, evolutionary hypothesis I can give you is that there were two origins of double fertilization in flowering plants. There you go. Now you know what time it is in, in Boston. Uh, there was an origin of double fertilization producing triploid endosperm in the common ancestor of 99% of flowering plants. And then there was a second time when Amborella went from diploid to triploid. But that the first flowering plants, all of the water lilies and the, and the uh, Ostrobaleales had a diploid uh, second fertilization event with a female gametophyte with four nuclei and four cells. And this is still our best hypothesis. You may ask, well, couldn't it have been originally triploid and then there was a, there were two reversions to diploid? I cannot exclude that, but there are theoretical reasons for rejecting it. So now, even though I didn't know this in 1995 when I did the theoretical work, I actually discovered that the first flowering plants actually have diploid endosperms. So now we have a hypothetical intermediate where there wasn't a gymnosperm double fertilization with an extra embryo. We still have a hypothetical intermediate, uh, but that now is no longer hypothesized. It's actually we found uh, a diploid endosperm that might well have evolved from a, an extra embryo. And we then know that there was a transition to triploid endosperms in most angiosperms. So there's our altruist embryo, I believe, in our early flowering plants, the water lilies and uh, the Ostrobaleales. And these are the first angiosperms. No longer theoretical, they have diploid endosperms. So then I ask, and this is what I want to ponder for a few minutes, what are the biological consequences of the insertion of a paternal genome into the embryo nourishing tissue of a seed? Putting a father's genetics into an equation that for hundreds of millions of years, a mother alone uh, liked to solve had to have some consequences. And this comes to some theoretical work that began in the 1960s, and it's called uh, inclusive fitness theory or kin selection. It applied initially to animals. It involved the evolution of insects, for example, and having sterile members of insect species, but it also applies equally to plants. And I can tell you that when a mother plant uh, produces many seeds on her body, she is equally genetically related to all of her embryos and all of her endosperms. That means to maximize her genetic fitness, she should make the best decisions of, of how much of her limited resources, her food, she's going to put into each of these embryos and endosperms. And she should try to assess developmentally which of them are likely to be most fit 
because they carry her genes. So in other words, she should make universal good choices about which seeds to abort and which seeds to carry forward. Now, an endosperm father is more closely related to its sibling embryo than to any other embryos on that plant. That means its survival depends on it getting food and it doesn't care about any of the other embryos or seeds uh, on the mother's plant body because it's unrelated. And this is assuming just again, pan mixes, meaning that all the fathers are different. We can do all the genetic modeling with fathers that are close relatives. It, you know, we can do all of that. Let's keep it simple. So the mother maximizes her fitness. Every generation, she produces seeds by investing limited resources in the most fit subset of embryos. But each father maximizes fitness by attempting to draw maternal resources to its own sibling embryo meaning the endosperm and then the embryo. So irrespective of how fit it is. So you can be the worst father in the world in terms of genetic fitness and, and everything else. You'll be the worst embryo, you're gonna die. But the fact is, all you can think about is, I either die as a seed it, it, here because I don't get any food or I push and try to signal and pull nutrients to me. And this is how it would look essentially, do you have a shared maternal resource pool? You have a bunch of uh, potential uh, embryos and uh, seeds. And the mother uh, has now got different fathers that are uh, siring the different embryos. They're all unrelated. And essentially the idea is that if you're a father, you want to draw resources to your seed alone. And if you're looking at it from a maternal strategy, you want to invest in the best ones, not just that one. So fathers will be greedy and mothers need to restrict investment and make sure they have control over how uh, embryos withdraw the food from the mother's body. And this is the essence of interparental conflict. The theoretical equations have been done for years. They began in, in 1979 with a pioneering work by uh, Eric Charnov, uh, but they've continued uh, through the last 30 years to examine the implications of this. So in other words, mothers and fathers do not always agree in plants. I will not speak to any other species, but uh, I have heard rumors that this is also true of humans. So is there evidence of interparental conflict in the seeds of flowering plants? And the answer is yes. There is actually 60 or more years of very simple uh, crossing that's been done by people who are agronomists. It's just been sitting in the literature. And, uh, and, and here it is. It doesn't matter if it's corn or it's wheat or it's any of these other things. Here's what happens with interploidy crosses. This means when you cross two different plants of a species that have different ploides. So interploidy crosses, we might take two parents that are diploid, but we could also create a tetraploid line and it could be male or a tetraploid line that's female. And we could cross that to a diploid female or a diploid male, or we could cross two tetraploids. And as you know, endosperm size and in general cell size tra uh, tracks in plants with ploidy. So you would expect if you were to look at this carefully, that if you measured the size of the endosperm of a diploid by diploid uh, uh, cross, you would get a certain endosperm size. But if you did a, a diploid by tetraploid cross, whether it was the mother or the father, these are reciprocal crosses here, you would get larger endosperms. And if you crossed a tetraploid by a tetraploid, you would get the largest endosperm size. That is, endosperm size would scale with ploidy. But if you do these crosses, this is just theory, you do these crosses, and I'm going to show you them, here's what happens when you have excess paternal genetics in your endosperm or excess maternal genetics. And this is a classic paper from 1998 that was published in Development in Arabidopsis. Here's your endosperm, or your overall seed size, and in diploid, and you'll notice it's the same size as in a tetraploid by tetraploid cross. But in a diploid mother by excess father, dip tetraploid father, you get the biggest seeds, the biggest endosperm. And when you have maternal excess, you get the smallest. In other words, it does not scale with ploidy. It scales with how much excess you have. If you have a father who's greedy, that father, when it has more of its genome in the endosperm, is clearly pulling more food from the mother. And the mother that is trying to pull, to push back, to put the brakes on this, when she has more of her genome in a seed, actually puts so much of the brakes on that you get the smallest seeds. And when they're in balance, whether they're diploid or tetraploid, you get the same size seed. And this 
is a consequence of something very important. The size of seeds results from interparental conflict. And we think often that this is a result of imprinting or DNA methylation, although we don't necessarily always have evidence. But for 60 years, people have been doing these crosses and getting these results. These are parent of origin effects. The, the genetics are only altered by genome dosage. And we know that this actually is evidence of interparental conflict in eudicots and monocots. But I was very curious to know whether this goes back to the beginning of flowering plants. And we didn't have any evidence, but I had a wonderful graduate student who just finished with me quite recently. And we turned to our water lilies. Uh, and this is a species that's actually from equatorial Africa. It's extinct in the wild. We now have a full genome of it, which you can, you can begin to work with. It is a very powerful tool. It's one of the only early lineages of flowering plants that really has the ability to be used at a molecular level because everything else is woody and very slow growing. Um, here you can see it's got a small genome. It has a rapid life cycle, basically from seed uh, to seed in five or six months. Uh, it can be grown very easily in, in greenhouses. And so we have actually published recently, uh, whoops, that's 2021, uh, or, I think, or 2020, I'm sorry. Uh, we've published the genome, it's accessible to anybody. And uh, we are always willing to share protocols with anyone in the world, uh, as well as the seed resources to grow. But we actually have a, a very nice genome of this plant. But what I can tell you is we started to study its embryology and you can see it has double fertilization. It produces a diploid endosperm in yellow. And you can see that here. And I'll, I'll come back to this perisperm in a minute. This is nucellus, but this perisperm is maternal diploid tissue. It's exactly genetically identical to the rest of the maternal plant. So we did reciprocal crosses. We created tetraploid lines in this water lily. And here's what we found. We emasculated, these are selfing, which is just like a Arabidopsis, really great system. And we would actually put a father from another plant on the, uh, on the stigmatic secretion. We did diploid by diploid. We did diploid by tetraploid fathers and tetraploid mothers by diploid fathers and so forth and so on. And then we looked at what happened after we did these crosses. And we asked, how big did the endosperm get? How, did, how fast did it develop? How did the embryo develop? And then we looked at this maternal tissue, this perisperm, which is an unusual feature of flowering plants. But it turns out in some lineages of flowering plants, most of the food in the seed, the mother puts into her own genetics, perisperm. This is genetically identical to the mother. And here's what we found. We found that when you had tetraploid fathers, you got a larger embryo and a larger endosperm, you got more rapid development. This again is consistent with the idea that paternal, uh, con interparental conflict means that fathers are selfish and they're doing everything they can to preserve their, their genetics and into the next generation by withdrawing as much food selfishly into the seed that they fathered. And when the maternal genome was in excess, when you had maternal tetraploid mothers, you saw that there was a really steep drop in embryo and endosperm development as the seed matured. In other words, the mother was putting the brakes on development because she wants to resist paternal selfishness. Now, here's where it gets interesting. When we looked at, and, and this means that an interparental conflict has probably been present uh, from the beginning of flowering plants when the father inserted its genome into the business of the mother, which had been always the female gametophyte. And now we had a genetically biparental embryo nourishing tissue endosperm. So interparental conflict, we at least think goes back to the common ancestor of water lilies and everything else. Uh, we have not done any work on Amborella and I doubt we will. It's a very difficult plant to do any work on. I, I, it's almost, a, it's, a, it's a small tree or a large shrub, but no matter what, it's very hard even to grow in greenhouses. Um, but when we looked at the perisperm, this maternal tissue that actually does most of the uh, storage and uh, uh, sequestration of, um, of food for the embryo, what we found was that the paternal genome dosage in endosperm and embryo did not affect how much food the mother put into the perisperm, which is her own genetics. Now, no one has really thought about the evolution of perisperm. It's a wonderful embryological set of questions uh, sitting there. But what I would suggest is that endosperm, uh, that, end, that the evolutionary shift of embryo nourishing tissue from biparental endosperm to maternal perisperm represents a maternal strategy to combat selfish behavior of the paternal genome in endosperm. In other words, in the common ancestor of 
water lilies. Their ancestors had a large diploid endosperm. The mother fought against the father and took back control by putting the food in her own body. Yes, there is an endosperm, but it does not store food. It does actually uh, serve as a passageway to the embryo, but it doesn't store this. So we think that this is in fact an evolved strategy uh, for the mother to retake control of her uh, embryo nourishing strategies. It is worth noting that water lilies are not the only group to have evolved a perisperm. It's also uh, in the Piperales and the Asparagaceae and some of its relatives in the Asparagales, and of course, broadly speaking, in the Caryophyllales. Mm -hmm. But again, so few people have done the embryology. There are other suggestions here that I show you in blue. These are all waiting to be studied. We just don't know. So I began with a simple question. What is endosperm? And I told you that we knew that most flowering plants had triploid genetically biparental and endosperms, but that most non-flowering plants had a haploid maternal genetics female gametophyte with a single embryo. And we had this evolutionary mystery. How do you go from this to this in flowering plants? And what I hope I've provided is a reasonable set of hypotheses. I wasn't there 135 million years ago when flowering plants got their start, but I've given us, I hope, a an opportunity to have con concrete hypotheses. That first step in this was the creation of double fertilization in many different lineages of gymnosperms, angiosperms being one of them, where you got an extra embryo, but you were still nourished by a female gametophyte. But eventually this extra embryo began to help its sibling and in doing so, it evolved into a diploid endosperm, which means that endosperm is an altruist. It is a, an embryo, a, an organism that gave up its life to promote the life of its sibling. And that over time, in different lineages of angiosperms, in Amborella and the rest of angiosperms, this diploid endosperm evolved through the addition of a, another female nucleus into a triploid endosperm that characterizes the foods that we eat, like corn, uh, maize, or rice, or so many other things. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an insight into what I think is part of Darwin's abominable mystery, which is how did flowering plants get their defining characteristics? What was their early evolution? And ultimately, what were their antecedent states? So I will uh, stop there and just tell you, I've been very lucky throughout my life to have some of the most amazing students uh, working in my lab and postdoctorals. Um, I've been very generously supported by the National Science Foundation in the United States, uh, and I continue to just love plants, and uh, nothing makes, can make me happier than to think that this lecture I'm giving uh, is a, a, to honor the memory of Professor Mohan Ram, uh, Ram uh, who also was truly a botanist and a lover of plants and a mentor to so many. So I will stop uh, sharing there and thank you again for your attention. I have some questions. So I, I, I've got a question here on the Podestamaceae, uh, which uh, may be the one really uh, great exception to the angiosperms in terms of having lost the double fertilization process. I think the Podestamaceae are just fascinating. I know uh, there have been many, uh, a number of studies, but I think, again, this is the kind of question one should be asking. Uh, what is the meaning of the loss of, 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 a, of a typical fertilization process in the Podestamaceae? And um, I don't know the answer. I, I simply will tell you uh, it, it's something that I think is an exciting question for people uh, to, to think about. Um, I have another question. Um, what is the theoretical impossibility of first starting with triploid uh, endosperm and then moving on to lineages with diploid and then finally moving back to triploid? It is by no means impossible. I cannot rule that hypothesis out. But what I can tell you is that there's a lot of theoretical work about interparental conflict. And, and I won't, the numbers are not important. The liter literature has been published. What happens when the mother adds additional genomes into the second fertilization event? When you go from diploid to triploid or triploid to pentaploid, you know there are many endosperms that have four haploid female nuclei and one sperm nucleus. There are some endosperms that have eight female haploid nuclei and one uh, sperm nucleus the amount of interparental conflict goes down. In other words, as you increase the number of female nuclei, the mother's best interests are uh, being favored. Now, it's possible that a father can somehow get you to move in a different direction. And I will tell you, there are instances where diploid endosperm in derived flowering plants has re-evolved 
from triploid endosperm. I don't know why, and I haven't studied it. Again, a tremendous uh, opportunity. And I'll just mention if there are a few of you who have your microphones on, just if you can mute, we're getting a little bit of background noise. Um, so if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, but anyway, what I would tell you is it's not impossible, but uh, it is, uh, uh, my sense is that the, the theory favors an origin of flowering plants with a diploid endosperm, and certainly it had to at some point have been uh, diploid. So, but I, I, one of the things that's very important in evolutionary biology uh, is to understand that I'm not trying to give anyone what I call so-called facts. I am trying to generate reasonable hypotheses. They can be falsified. And I would tell you that one of the great things about writing and publishing is that uh, all the rest of the world has every opportunity to come up with a better idea. And I encourage everyone to do so. That's the beauty of science. Um, let's see, uh, uh, other questions. I'm just gonna, I have to look over at my chat box. Someone asked, how do bisporic or tetrasporic embryo sacs fit into this hypothesis? Ah, now we're gonna get down to some serious embryology. I, I have looked into this and actually there's a paper I published with my, my, my postdoctoral and student in 2008, where we looked at the genetics of bisporic and tetrasporic uh, female gametophytes, embryo sacs. And we can show you that these, show, these are, are consistent with the mother uh, increasing her control over out resource allocation. And this is one of the things. So you, many of you recall uh, the classic 1950 embryology te textbook by Professor Mahashwari. Uh, it sits on my shelf um, and there's a diagram in it. Uh, an incredibly, for me, I can see it as if it was yesterday. And it has all the different types of female gametophyte or embryo sac development in flowering plants. I can remember memorizing it for my qualifying exam as a PhD student at Berkeley. I didn't know why I should know it. I just knew that there was all this diversity and I needed to know it. But really the reason there are so many different types of embryo sacs and flowering plants has nothing to do with the, the patterning, whether you get 16 nuclei or you get, it has to do with the genetic outcomes. Every different type of embryo sac in a flowering plant is a different kind of endosperm genetics. And I'd encourage you to go back and look at my, my paper. It was in the International Journal of Plant Sciences in 2008. But wh what I can tell you for sure is that it's all about genetics. And we're getting a share screen here. No. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, which I don't know. Sonali, let please me just go stop sharing. Sonali, please stop sharing. Uh, well, anyway, I can go on. <laughs> we, well, let's we, uh, say continue the questions while that's happening, could you? Um, yeah, of course, I got my chat yeah. box open. So great question about bisporic and tetrasporic. Well, now here we go. Um, so what is the advantage of triploid endosperm in place of diploid? Why the evolution? And my thinking is, again, that it is the genetics that allows, and the, the triploidy is about adding a maternal haploid genome to increase the mother's balance. So when you're diploid, you have equal contributions between mother and father. When you're triploid, the mother now has two genomes. When you're pentaploid, the mother now has a four to one ratio of her genetics in the endosperm uh, compared to the male. So it's about maternal control. Um, what is the origin of the word endosperm? Why sperm? Ah, um, so sperm <laughs> I think has two meanings. Um, and the one is the sperm meaning male gamete. But if you think of the term spermatophytes, that means seed plants. So sperm also has the meaning Speed, uh, uh, has a reference to the term or, or the, the structure seed. So endosperm means within the seed, and it's this tissue within the seed, I believe. And if I'm wrong, uh, someone who knows the etymology can, can get, uh, get to that. Uh, um, just a moment. Yeah. There were just a few more questions in the chat. I'm not sure where you're getting these from, but... Uh, yes, I am. They're coming through. Uh, uh, I see some more. No, there so the next one is... What, there were some older ones. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, yeah, do you yeah. want to read them to me? Yeah, Nita, so that would probably one was after the bisporic, tetrasporic. What about organella genomes, which are uniparentally inherited to parent of origin effect? Ah, 
Great question. I, and I, and to the questioner, I, I, I say to you, you should think this up I, and, and think it out. I do not know the answer. But I think, again, you know, there are most, you know, flowering plants have a uh, uniparental organeller uh, maternal, but there are some that are paternal. And in the gymnosperms, there is variation. Um, I, no one has asked or, or begun to even think about this. So excellent question. This is exactly the kind of question that I would encourage uh, everyone to, to ask. But uh, sadly, I have no answer. <laughs> So there is a small digression to abominable. Uh, Dr. Friedman, a question with reference to the terminology used by Darwin. How much of an influence do you think William Carruthers' belief in the creation theory influenced Darwin's use of the term abominable? Oh, sure. Wait, say, can you read that again? I'm sorry, I, I missed the middle uh, part. So what influenced it? William Carruthers' belief in creation influenced Darwin's use of the term abominable? Ah, I don't think very much. Um, so, I, and I published a, a, a paper uh, back in 2009 where I went back to all of Darwin's correspondence. And there's a more recent paper uh, that just was published in the last year on the abominable mystery that picks up where uh, my work left off, which is a very, a very nice paper. What Darwin was really worried about has to do with the fossil record and it being incomplete. Uh, when Darwin was, I mean, in the 1850s, the 1860s, and the 1870s, the fossil record for most groups of organisms, animals and plants, was, was pretty good. But it was not good for early flowering plants. Most of the fossils of what we would think of as the stereotypical flowering plants, and he was thinking about eudicots, started in the middle of the Cretaceous. And what we know, of course, is that the flowering plant fossil record goes back to the beginning of the Cretaceous. And so Darwin was looking at a fossil record where everyone was looking at all of these in the middle of the creation of the Cretaceous, all of the modern groups of flowering plants sort of magically appear in the fossil record. And what you couldn't do was trace them back deeper into time to a common ancestor. And that was consistent with a creationist perspective, because creationists in the 19th century would say that there might be a worldwide global extinction and then immediately poof. Many, many, many different groups of plants were put back on Earth, and and all at once you had a new and and in fact the Swiss uh, geologist Louis Agassiz, who was a, an ardent creationist, had this idea that there would be mass extinctions of, around the globe, would be sterilized, and then in a miraculous event, all new life would be put back on Earth. So Darwin was very worried about these views, and he didn't think that and what he was worried about was that the flowering plant fossil record looked like miraculous creation. Um, what he believed, though, was that the fossil record was not full. And he was correct that we needed to dig more holes, we needed to find more fossils. And in fact, what's wonderful, if you read his correspondence, and again, I've, I've, I've published some these letters back and forth with the paleontologists of his day, they're all keenly aware of how inadequate the flowering plants are. And so he was sure that the fossil record of flowering plants had been lost or that, we, or that it had not been found. And uh, so Carruthers would have been just indicative of other people who were staunch uh, uh, creationists who would have used the fossil record uh, but Darwin was obsessing about this, or not obsessing, but he was he was concerned about it right up to the last year of his life. So it's a fascinating story uh, of what sometimes you just have to be patient. So we have four more questions. Um, mm -hmm. I hope we can fit those in. Uh, uh, one is, is it necessary to infer such developmental pathways as being sequential in the process of evolution? Could it be parallel and whatever we are, whatever we have surviving now, maybe because of other genetic factors? So, I, I guess I don't know. Uh, I mean, um, I what I would tell you is I've, I've given you the, uh, after you know several decades of thought. I think the the, the possible uh, the possible developmental or hypothetical intermediates based on my read of of, of comparative biology. Could it, for example, you could ask the question, could the could it be that uh, flowering plants had two separate evolutions of endosperm? I, I mean, I suppose it's possible, but it's not the most parsimonious interpretation of our known data. Um, are there groups that uh, are extinct that could have uh, uh, done other things? It's possible, but I don't I don't have in the absence of evidence. Um, I, I think parsimony just requires us to to create 
the simplest explanations. But but again, I, I would I think that's the that's the thing to to be, to, rem, to be reminded of. Simplest explanations need not be correct, but the scientific method requires us to certainly work with the simplest method uh, hypotheses until we have something that falsifies them and requires a more complicated set of hypotheses. Um, so one question about whether podostomacy could represent the mother taking control. I, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Okay. So when you say altruism, do you mean you mean the male being selfish so that its gene gets carried forward, but the embryo carries the female genes too? So why should the altruism be attributed to the male only? Ah, I, I'm sorry. I, I probably wasn't as sufficiently precise. It's the embryo that's the altruist. It does carry the father's genes. But and this is this gets into the details of the math from 1995, which I, I'll I apologize I didn't go into detail. But in here's the thing: in flowering plants, in every seed, there's only one female gametophyte, so you, you can and only one egg, right? In all non-flowering plants, there's more than one egg. And so what people didn't realize when they were doing the early inclusive fitness theory is I'm specifically saying that double fertilization evolved in a gymnosperm with multiple eggs. And you have different fathers who are unrelated that are doing double fertilization in different eggs. And what this means is that actually the initial stage that drives altruism is interpaternal competition. And I'm sorry I didn't go into detail. I didn't want to uh, go too far, but as I say, it's in the paper. The fact is that the embryo with the father's genome is not in a flowering plant context. It's in a gymnosperm context. And it's trying to be selfish by making sure that the other father of the other egg doesn't win. And so now you have these two sperm from one father that are cooperating. So it's a, it's a separate aspect of this whole story. So excellent question. I apologize for the lack of clarity, but it has it's, it's there to be read. So the other question uh, following this is, what about autonomous endosperm formation when there is no father in <laughs> Excellent question. And I say, again, so many things. Embryology, as you, I think many of you know, is a field that has become much smaller than it was uh, 50 years ago. That does not mean all of the questions have been answered. That question in particular is an excellent question. What happens with apomixes? And I will tell you, we have flowering plants, for example, where you require a fertilized endosperm, but you have a, an unfertilized embryo. You can have all kinds of things. And no one, I think, has done the work to actually use these study systems to ask why these, these unusual patterns. And what I would encourage everyone to do, go back and read Maheshwari, go back and read the original embryology. It's all sitting there. And what you have to bring now in the year 2021 is your own questions to wonderful old observations. And I encourage all of you to do that. I do not have an answer to that question, but I would be thrilled if someone who is here today uh, actually went to work on this and I, and I got to read that publication. Okay, here's a bit of a side uh, thing. There are many examples of obligate aquatic pteridosperms, pterodophytes and angiosperms, but hardly any aquatic gymnosperms. Mm -hmm. Are they extinct or are there, are there, are there any other reasons? That's a great question. <laughs> and we don't know, I think, of any aquatic gymnosperms. And and I I think it's fascinating. Clearly, early in the evolution of flowering plants, we have very old uh, aquatic angiosperm fossils that go back almost 130 something, 5 million years. Um, we have the water lilies. We have other groups early in the angiosperm history that become aquatic. Um, the early monocots, we think, certainly were wet. <laughs> if They may not have been aquatic. Um, I don't know why, but I think it's fascinating. I'll tell you something else that didn't happen for 230 million years after the uh, origin of seed plants and then the origin of flowering plants. We don't think there were really any herbaceous gymnosperms. There might have been one. Um, it's controversial, I, I, you know, maybe. But something radical happened at the beginning of, of flowering plants. There seems to have been a developmental sense that, that what was a very static a conservative way of developing, that you were woody, you were slow growing, you had largish seeds, your life cycles were long. 
And all of a sudden, flowering plants are born, you evolve herbaceous plants. So just to tell you, all grasses, all monocots, all herbaceous eudicots, their ancestors in the pre-angiosperm seed plants are woody plants. Herbaceousness in flowering plants is secondarily evolved. The ancestors of seed plants were herbaceous before the acquisition of a vascular cambium. And then for 230 million years, you couldn't get small. You had pteridophytes, you had ferns. So anyway, this is a question I think that is really interesting because it asks about evolutionary history and patterning. And I'll just tell you that last week in Science, there was a paper published uh, that addressed this very question about sort of complexity and uh, the evolutionary history of uh, vascular plants. So I, it's a, a, an interesting paper, and I, just as you will see, it just came out last week. Uh, Ned, uh, do you have time? Do you need to rush off? Because there are some four or five questions more, and I, it would be nice if you could address them. If, you, if, if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy to do so, yes. Okay. Um, so one is, how do we know, do we know what the developmental genes what which developmental genes were recruited for making endosperm cells as i understand the second fertilized embryo in early plants led to the development of endosperm I'm not excellent question uh and and i would i would suggest that uh, one of the things that someone could do is ask if you it, it, let's just start with the hypothesis that an embryo evolved into endosperm and if you were able to study, and here we have a, like a water lily now with a full genome, um, if you were able to study the developmental biology of endosperm and embryos in water lilies, um, and you were to look to see what genes were central to the development of, of the, these, uh, these uh, seeds with their embryos and endosperms, what would you discover? Would you find that there are embryo uh, genes associated with embryo development that are in endosperm? Um, would you find that there are, uh, for example, the female gametophytes uh, used to in gymnosperms uh, nourish embryos? Did the uh, first angiosperms borrow those developmental genes and put them into endosperm? I have no idea. Nobody studied it, but this is exactly what I'd, I'd like to think my hypotheses can do, which is to stimulate that very question, and then someone should collect some data. And I think it would be thrilling. So, a follow up question from the same person. Uh, are there any differences in the mechanics of molecular interactions, for instance, silencing genes between parental and maternal genes in the double fertilized endosperm and embryo? Yeah, so I mean, we know that there are certainly many imprinted genes in, in model systems. It's been looked at in Arabidopsis. Um, you know, it has to do with DNA methylation and so forth, and histone methylation. And um, and we, we I can tell you that my wonderful graduate student, who's now a postdoctoral at MIT, uh, is looking at uh, these very questions. And um, I think we'll begin to, to see whether there are parent of origin uh, aspects of, of gene expression in uh, water lilies, uh, but we don't know the answer yet, uh, but th that's being actively investigated. So is the diploid endosperm functionally different from the triploid or is it similar? Ah, so in, in the water lilies, it's certainly reduced because of perisperm, but in the Australopithecus, it's a perfectly good normal endosperm. And I actually have not done the interploidy crosses in the Australopithecus. They've been very difficult. We've tried to induce uh, tetraploid lines in Elysium. We're actually going to start trying this again, uh, but right now we don't have those things uh, worked out. And of course, they're all woody plants, so they're they're not quite as easy to work with. Uh, for example, for a PhD student, if it takes four years to get your system to uh, actually reproduce, um, it's not a good thing to do a PhD on. But since I'm an old man, I can I can work on this. <laughs> okay, uh, where would the species of Anothera fit in terms of evolution? They carry one polar nucleus in their embryo cells. Uh, where would I'm sorry, which species? Uh, Anothera. Uh, with four. Oh, in a theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just, again, this is one of these instances where you've had a reversal. And again, so I tell you the theory says you should go up in maternal contribution and, um, and Enothera has gone down. And, and I think, uh, you know, what I, I, I think some of you who know the embryology of Enothera will know it has the most bizarre 
uh, sort of nuclear behavior with ring chromosomes. And, um, and this has been studied for a very long time. I have no idea what Ethereum is doing, but I would, I would again encourage people to look at the uh, wonderful old embryological literature uh, and then ask some new questions. It, it would be wonderful. So the last question, how would you reword your hypothesis if you removed anthropocentric terms such as altruism? Ah, uh, that's a, a really interesting question. So I'm going to put it back to you. Why should we assume that altruism needs to be defined anthropocentrically? Uh, is altruism a characteristic of humans or is it something that's defined genetically and evolutionarily? Um, and um, I am only using it in the sense of a genetic uh, and evolutionary concept. So this takes an interesting, I, this, these are actually, it's a really interesting question. So when I say that an, a plant embryo is an altruist, I'm not thinking a plant embryo is a nice thing or a friendly thing. I'm thinking of it uh, in the same way that uh, insects that are altruists that don't reproduce with their own gametes, they are simply the uh, end results of genetics and evolution at play to maximize fitness. Uh, it, it, it is a hard edge. And um, so my, I, I would say, while most humans would only think of altruism as applying to uh, humans and may, you know, and, and, and potentially other animals, uh, you know, maybe, you know, other mammals, um, probably, I don't know whether there's earthworm al altruism or not, but, uh, but I don't think of it that way. And, and that's maybe because I'm a comparative biologist. I think too often we, we restrict our concepts to just humans when uh, we're just one of uh, millions and millions of species. So for me, altruism has nothing to do with the brain, has nothing to do with being nice. It has everything to do with surviving. That was a great uh, talk, Ned. And I think we do have to bring the question and answer to uh, close, session to close. Um, thank you again. There have been many uh, comments of appreciation for the and we, you know, we really are happy that you could do this. I hand the floor over to Professor Kes Rao for a formal vote of thanks. Ah, uh, I think uh, this being the 75th year of the department and the 91st birthday of Professor Mohan Ram, I think there is nothing like uh, this lecture which could kickstart the great things in this department. I think uh, William Friedman, you have really given a wonderful, wonderful insights into the embryology, which this department would certainly would be proud of where it has been started. The, there was times, it is said that when students were taught sex in plants, people were afraid to send their girls to this school. But now people are happy. We in fact has 90% of our students, girl students, and they are really contributing to the progress of the botany at this department. We are really happy that you have revitalized the concepts of the embryology. And certainly this lecture is going to be a mark in the curriculum that we are going to use perhaps this video once again to educate the students. There are a lot of students on the Facebook, their questions we were not able to put forth to you, but we will certainly try to answer them using whatever little knowledge we have. And I really thank from heart of my, and all my colleagues join me to thank you for sparing your time and giving this wonderful lecture in memory of Professor H.Y. Mohan Ra. I would also like to say, especially Professor Geeta, my senior colleague, to suggest your name as the best possible person. And by accepting this invitation, you have really graced us. I would also like to express my thanks to Delhi University Computer Center for the technical support, especially Mr. Nitin, who has been taking care of all the networking issues and transmission issues of this lecture, and I specifically thank. Nevertheless, 
the photo compilation of professor mohan ram was done by dr rekha choudhary and dr anuradha agarwal and we really appreciate their effort to make that short video which has a compilation of professor mohan ram and manse mohan ram's visits to various places and it's a pleasure for everyone to look at the great personalities that we have thank you very much professor william friedman for giving us a wonderful talk in memory of a great person like professor h m mohanra thank you very much i thank all the participants for sparing their time and listening to this and all my colleagues for their support the entire departmental colleagues has participated in it making this event a success thank you very much professor geeta you want to say something this i want to say something Hello. Yeah, Dr. Jaswant, children, thrilled with the lecture. Really, that the parents would have absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I'm just reading out. Sushmita and Rahul, Prof. Yeah. Mohan Ram's children, are thrilled with the lecture. They believe that their parents would have absolutely loved it. Both H Y M and Mansi would have really enjoyed it. Could we have them kind of come on and say this or not? Are they there? Yeah, they could yeah. uh, unmute themselves. Yeah, and here. Please show yourself. Yeah, please show yourself. Yeah, Professor there Friedman. Professor Feed Friedman, thank you for a brilliant lecture. Uh, both my parents were avid botanists, and I've actually heard my mum, you know, wonder at why the endosperm had triploidy. Uh, I remember hearing this as a child. And both of them would have loved it. Ma would have taken copious notes. and they would have argued and debated through the evening and through the month on some of the aspects that you what i also really enjoyed was uh, i mean your slides were amazing uh, your uh, you know thoughts for future research and your encouragement was something that would have touched my parents very deeply thank you very much rahul and i have grown up in a house where my parents uh, took visitors and friends for walks showing the gardens and talking about every tree i was 40 when i realized my father didn't know the names of all the trees i mean at the age of 40 i mean it's impossible to know every the name of every plant but baba seemed to and my parents also you know fought sometimes uh, sometimes they shared recipes and uh, once uh, when they were eating something and my mother wanted the recipe of something and my father forgot the common name and then he said oh you know it's cuminum uh, siminum and that is something that is used a lot in indian cooking so thank you for a wonderful lecture uh, and what a great beginning to the uh, memorial series that we have had today thank you thank you department of botany Thank you, Professor Lakhan Paul, for being so supportive uh, and helping us. Thank you, Professor Rao, for all the support that you've given. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. to everybody. Thanks to everybody. Okay, you can log in now. So, we closing this now. I think we are closing the session. Um, thank you, and bye bye. Great seeing you, Ned. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Professor Ned. Bye. Let's go. 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 Let's go